Well, um, things continue to capture our interest. Throughout history, we have discussed things in themselves, affective yet somewhat unfathomable. We have had things present or ready at hand, meaning how we attend to things, how we relate to them, depending on their readiness or unreadiness. We have debated their semiotics, the meaning of things, how things are valued, how we make sense of the world through things. And we have pondered their being, what is the ontology of things, how do they bond, assemble, um, and also fragment, disintegrate, and drift apart. How do things present themselves to us, and how do they affect our actions and practices, and how is all this possibly interrelated to human being? But regardless of all this controversial debate throughout history about things, one thing one thing is absolutely for sure, things are all around us. And there is hardly anything that we can envisage that is without the inherent participation of things. All our actions, all our practices, our own being is mediated in, from, through, alongside, or whatever with things. We are always immersed in things, and it is not always sure who directs the course of things. But there is then one thing that I want to take for granted, that we all agree that nothing explains and distinguishes human beings, humanity itself, as well as it 2.5 to 3 million years uh, of ongoing materialization. And if we agree on that, then we must as well agree that things are an essential part of humanity itself. Well, it's per perhaps not a breathtaking revelation. This has been discussed by many, not only over a cup of coffee here between Latour and Michel Serre, for some time now. Uh, the simple point I am making here at the beginning of my talk is that there is no way around discussing humans or humanity without including things. And the interesting reciprocity of this claim is that it is absolutely nonsensical to discuss things without their relation to humans, at least as a part of any archaeological endeavor. Well, uh, such a claim, of course, demands that I at least try to answer the question of what things are as opposed to non-things. However, and uh, I ask you to bear with me on that matter, I, I intend to, to uh, invest my 15 minutes to a slightly uh, different path. So I'll just say that things are objects let's call it material culture, that stand close to us. Or as Heidegger posed some 70 years ago, nearness, it seems, cannot be encountered directly. We succeed in reaching it rather by attending to what is near. Near to us are what we usually call things. Well, some of you would like to point out that the definition of things goes far beyond the notion of material culture. Well, in, in this text, Heidegger talks about God and the soul as things. Uh, and for that matter, Earth's gravity is a thing because it affects uh, the way other things uh, are shaped and caused, including us humans. But for my purpose today, I want to stick with the notion of things as material culture, or as Gavin Lucas concludes in his book from several years ago, Understanding the Archaeological Record, this is what makes material culture distinct from other things. This is why we can do archaeology, because we recognize the human in objects. Yes, it's due to their nearness, due to the immediacy and intimacy of things as material culture, that makes the separation between things and humans uh, untenable. So, things and humans are 
different parts of the same composition. This does not mean that they are the same uh, or in any way equal. That would be like discussing the human body simply from the perspective of the skeleton. An interesting thing that we archaeologists tend to do very often, but for a different reason. The human body is a composition of bones and muscles and skin and, and uh, hair and tendons and, and a massive ecosystem of bacteria and viruses and yeast and fungi, etc. Uh, these things are not the same or of the same origin, but belong to the same composition. And the same goes for things and humans. They are not the same or of the same origin, but they belong to the same compositions. And this means that things never appear or never present themselves in isolation, but always as a part of compositions, as entities of co or as entities of composites, as nodes in a network, as members of a congregation, as parts of an assemblage. And an assemblage is a composition, not any random collection of things, but an assemblage of various parts that are inherent to the assemblage itself creating a composition that is not reducible to its individual parts, but has new and new properties or properties of its own. Okay, having now discussed things and the relation to humans and, and with assemblages, admittedly somewhat superficial, I want to take now a sharp turn and introduce to you a project that I am participating in and present to you some of the challenges that we are facing or academic issues that we are dealing with and of course in respect uh, to the things that I have been touching upon. My favorite things, material, culture, archives, cultural heritage and meaning is a multinational interdisciplinary project hosted at the University of Iceland and situated uh, on the intersection between history material culture studies, including both archaeology and anthropology, and museum and archival studies. Its main scholarly uh, aim is twofold. Firstly, to investigate the material world of the Icelandic population in the late modern era, mainly 18th, 19th centuries, as this is represented in archives of written and material form, and the different relations and interactions between people and things uh, implied in these archives. And secondly, to explore the tensions between these different archives, asking how they reflect the material past and how the possible discrepancies between them may be dealt with, as well as how these various archives have affected the way we construct, present, discuss and research the cultural, cultural heritage. Well, you may have noticed that there has been a slight change in terminology. In the project, we talk about archives, both in written and material form, rather than archives and assemblages or, or, or using different con con uh, concepts. For this, there is both are somewhat trivial circumstances and an academic reason. If you want to know about the trivial circumstances, we can talk about that later. But the academic reason has to do with the constitution of archives that, uh, in the conventional sense, are collections of documents, textual objects, which, like any other collection of objects, is dependent on the archives, or meaning the institution then, or museum or archive, complex infrastructure for its well-being. Hence, the alleged rupture between things and text uh, is not as clear-cut as one might assume. And material culture collections are in the same way, not composed by mere objects. Each collection is linked to a variety of attached information, textual information, descriptions, and scientific analysis. Hence, both documentary archives and material, cu material culture collections are a mixture of material and textual information about the past. And approaching the material culture collections and the documentary archives as hybrid compositions of material and textual sources 
enables us to treat the sources, texture or material on a level basis. Therefore, only a single term, one concept, the archive. Applying to both types of assemblages. By this, we however do not claim that material culture archives need to be totally consistent uh, with the documentary archives, but rather we, we emphasize that the tension that may exist between these two types of archives does not rule out their juxtaposition, but instead affords and calls for an exploration of their characteristics, how they divide, how they communicate, <coughs> and how their joint forces may allow for alternative perspectives on the past. And without going into that in, in, in any fur further detail, uh, this approach draws, of course, on some of Deleuze's and Qatari's assemblage theory has been mentioned many times today, um, but mainly perhaps part, um, in which it extends into linguistics and, and uh, our approach certainly reflects the idea of coding and territorialization, coding as the process of ordering matter and territorialization uh, uh, as a process of taking on forms of content and taking on forms of expressions. Yeah, but now back to the project, my favorite things, and it's archives of written and material flow. At the heart of the project, at its core, stands an archive of a considerable size. Uh, Yeah, 30,000 probate inventories from the period of 230 years, more or less, from the latest 17th century to the earliest 20th century. It is an uh, impressive assemblage of documents that covers the entire island, all of Iceland, and includes all ranks of society from the richest land and estate owners to the poorest servants and paupers, men and women. Around 30% of all people that died in Iceland in that period can be found in uh, these inventories. The in inventories are an interest interesting documentation of the material possession of uh, Icelanders at the time of their death in the late centuries of Icelandic histories. There are roughly estimated about 3 million objects and things listed in these inventories, which is about 15 times the number of all objects in stored in all cultural history <laughs> museums in Iceland altogether, taken together. But in addition to this, we are looking into museum collections and their documentation on acquisition and their collection policies, as well as into the archaeological record, which is archived in the National Museum of Iceland. How have these archives come to be? How are they constituted? What processes and structures dictate their collection? And in order to delve into these questions, I started very recently a small individual project within the framework of, of the, the, the larger project, the project as a whole, that deals exactly with this issue. My interest lies in the question of how objects from the various archives are categorized and how they communicate with each other. Simply put, how is this related to this and this? What we here have here in front of us are all one and the same thing, at least on the surface, because all of these things that we have are lamps. Meaning, one found at an archaeological excavation, one, as I mentioned, in a, a probate inventory, lampy in Icelandic, lamp, and then uh, an object donated to the National Museum, all 19th century lamps. Are these objects the same? If yes, what are their common properties and that allow for their sameness? And if not, how are they different? And how does this difference affect our understanding of lamps and their position within Icelandic history or, or their meaning for the history of Icelanders? How does this 
different constitution, which is evident, I, I feel, affect their historiography. And this must lie in the archives or in the way these things archive. We archaeologists habitually work with fragmented and incomplete assemblages. Their fragmentation is mainly due to formation processes, but also depending on our methodology. Probate inventories, on the other hand, give a strong feeling for completeness. That, however, is a delusion. Mm. The objects in the inventories have gone through a process of selection, just as the objects from an archaeological excavation. There are also certain formation processes that lead to these inventories, and the material properties of things are also an integral part of their archiving. For example, small objects tend to appear more seldom in, in, in inventories than large objects. We find a box of all kinds of things. So we don't know what are all these, all, these are these small objects that, that are not listed individually. But what about museum objects? They are as well, they as well uh, go through various selection mechanisms that are both depending on the museum's collection policies and the material properties of the objects that demonstrate uh, incompleteness as well. All of these archives, independent of their differences, are fragmentary and incomplete, and, they cons and their construction and composition is both based on the methods we apply, modes of archiving, and the things' its own material properties. An archaeological archive underscores things materially, their material properties, their resilience to withstand time, and of course, their relation to other things building up that archive. This lamp, for instance, was a part of an archaeological household assemblage. The probate inventories, on the other hand, are only a reference to the things that they list. These things, they don't exist anymore. Uh, but exist as mentioned uh, in these lists. However, the inventories produce more than anything else, a notion of a closed context, how things and, and what things were uh, related to the person. They underscore personal properties. However, they are often very inscrutable. An isolated world leaves out important information. What did, is this lamp made of? It, is it a, a, a copper lamp like, like the other two? So, or, or is it an iron lamp or even a stone lamp? Although well, that's quite unlikely, it's relatively expensive. So we could draw some conclusion from it. Museum collections are then a totally different kind of archives uh, where the living context of the thing is almost entirely lost and where the things often appear as individual isolated items rather than expressing, uh, rather expressing the contemporary value of the material past, both as seen through the eyes of the collector or the museum and the donator, the public. Okay, so uh, to sum up what I've been saying, things and humans are inher uh, inherently interrelated and always parts of mutual compositions. Uh, to my mind, the idea of thingless humans or, or, or inhuman things is absolutely inconceivable. This affects the way things and humans assemble and archive. For example, each of the archives here, the archaeological as opposed to the probate inventories, as opposed to the museum collection, present different aspects of the human thing relation, as humans and things of the past and present are differently invested in and engaged with these archives. Okay, so I, with these words, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, once again, hope you bear with me. I, I did not provide any path-breaking conclusions or results, but I hope I have at least made a good case for my uh, project. Thank you very much.